A warm welcome to everyone, uh, those that are with us here in the room, uh, and also those that are joining us online. Uh, this is being live streamed and uh, available on UN Web TV. Um, warm welcome to this briefing on developments in Sudan and prospects for democratization um, in the country. Uh, this briefing is organized by International IDEA. Um, for those of you that don't know International IDEA, we are an intergovernmental organization with 34 member states uh, that are focused on strengthening and advancing democracy around the world. Uh, we work across all regions of the world um, and um, we are a think and a do tank. We collect good practices on democracy building around the world and we provide technical assistance uh, on democ democracy building and democratic reforms. Uh, we are permanent observers uh, to the UN General Assembly. Uh, I'm Annika Silva-Leander. I'm IDEA's permanent observer to the UN. Um, as you all know, on April 15th, 2023, uh, tensions between the Sudanese armed forces and the paramilitary rapid support forces turned into fighting in Sudan, escalating into a severe armed conflict that has engulfed the country in what risks turning into a large-scale civil war. And as you probably know, the currently warring factions took power uh, through a military coup on October 25th, 2021. And this coup upended a fragile democratic transition that started after the removal of longtime ruler Omar al-Bashir in 2019. Since the fighting broke, up in, broke out in April, hundreds of civilians have been killed in Sudan and many thousands more injured and those numbers are growing by the day. The situation in Darfur and Khartoum are particularly catastrophic. Uh, entire neighborhoods have no running water, limited electricity supplies, and more than two thirds of hospitals near areas of con conflict have been incapacitated. So there are currently acute shortages of food, water, medicines, and fuel, with prices of essential items and transport sharply increasing. Even before the recent surge in hostilities, approximately one third of Sudan's population faced hunger every day. And the ongoing conflict has placed millions more at risk. According to the World Food Program, 19 million people, so two fifths of the country's population are now expected to face food insecurity and hunger in the coming months. As of early <clears throat> this month, the conflict had displaced over two million people, including over 500,000 who have fled to other countries, including Chad, Central African Republic, Egypt, Ethiopia, Libya, and South Sudan. As the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, noted two days ago in a high-level pledging event on Sudan and the region, the scale and speed of Sudan's descent into death and destruction is unprecedented. And without strong international support, Sudan could quickly become a place of total lawlessness with spillover effects, not just for the country itself, but also across the region. So we are organizing, International Ideas, organizing this briefing for those of you that are interested uh, in uh, or following uh, developments in Sudan or working on Sudan. And the briefing is intended to shed light uh, on the situation and developments that led to where the country is now. The long and winding road to democratization in Sudan, uh, we will talk about how international actors try to support the transition to democracy, the role of civil society throughout this process, and we will also discuss uh, what the prospects for peace are in democratization, um, and also the role uh, that international actors, including the UN, um, have and can do in the current context to continue supporting democratic forces inside and outside the country. Uh, so for this discussion, uh, we have a very interesting panel of uh, Sudanese experts with us who will share their views. Um, we start with um, Suleiman Baldo. Dr. Suleiman Baldo is the executive director of the Sudan Transparency and Policy Tracker. He sits here uh, to the right. Um, Dr. Baldo was previously a senior policy advisor for the Enough Project uh, and directed the Sudan Democracy First Group, a Sudan-focused think tank aiming to help uh, to bring about faster democratization in the country. Um, 
and Dr. Baldo has also lectured at the University of Khartoum. Uh, we also have with us um, Dr. Sami Said to my left. Um, he's head of International Ideas Sudan program uh, since 2020 and who has had to leave the country since the conflict broke up broke out and uh, he's now operating from, from the US. So he will share his perspectives um, on the conflict and what International IDEA has been doing leading up to now in, in support of the democratization process in Sudan. We also have with us uh, Maha Tambal. Uh, she's currently program manager at the DT Institute in Washington DC, but she is here as a civil society representative. Um, she has worked extensively with civil society uh, in Sudan uh, to strengthen their role during the democratization process. Um, but before we uh, engage in the panel discussion uh, and um, each of the panelists will present their views, uh, we will have an interactive discussion. I'll share a few questions with them. Then we will open up the floor also for your questions so that we can have an interactive discussion. Um, but before we start, uh, I wanted to hand over to uh, Mr. Dihun Ostawar from the Netherlands permanent representation here at the UN. Um, He's deputy head of the political section of the permanent representation, and we're very honored to have him with us today to just provide a few uh, introductory remarks to this discussion. Um, in the Netherlands is a member state of international idea, and they are also the chair of international idea in 2023. So we're very honored to have uh, you here today with us, and I hand it over to you for some introductory remarks. Thank you very much, uh, Madam uh, Permanent Representative um, of IDEA International, uh, uh, dear Anika. Um, the honor is really um, ours. Um, uh, my personal honor to be here today with you, with all colleagues here present, and also um, for the Netherlands to be, as you mentioned, uh, chairing um, international idea for, for the year 2023. And, um, Already some introductory points have been made, so I'll, I'll keep mine uh, very short, but just to um, share with you a number of points from, uh, from, from the point of view of the Netherlands and uh, from our side of engagement in the important uh, region uh, of the Horn of Africa and in Sudan specifically. Um, let me start by, by saying that it is very clear that uh, humanitarian aid and humanitarian relief together with achieving something that would be a more durable uh, form of ceasefire are really key and the most urgent priorities uh, at the moment. Uh, the Netherlands is a key donor um, of the UN Central Emergency Response Fund, which has allocated over $80 million to the Horn of Africa uh, so far, including $18 million for Sudan. Additionally, uh, the Netherlands has provided 65 million euros to OCHA's country-based pooled fund in the region this year alone. And specifically for Sudan, our humanitarian support uh, amounts to over 20 million euros, uh, including uh, efforts done by Dutch Relief Alliance. And of course, we're part of the European Union, and as many of you will, will, will have uh, seen, the European Union committed um, additional 190 million euros in humanitarian and development aid. For the Netherlands, uh, like for other uh, countries um, working together and in partnership with the Sudanese people, a uh, key priority is also uh, promotion and protection of human rights in Sudan. We achieve that and try to achieve that through a strong partnership um, on the ground with relevant uh, stakeholders, with relevant civil society organizations. We, of course, strongly condemn human rights violations currently happening in Sudan. It is really heartbreaking, and I cannot emphasize that enough um, to see what the people of Sudan, uh, who fought so hard for democracy and, and, and a political and stable transition, have to go through now, uh, during these days and these weeks. These violations cannot go unaddressed, they cannot go unpunished. Uh, there must be accountability, there must be investigation, and there must be prosecution for, for violations. Um, as was said already, the briefing today is meant to 
not just discuss the situation in Sudan, but to specifically provide um, an analysis of what um, avenues there are for democratization uh, in Sudan. It may sound as, a, as, a, as, a, as a something unattainable in the current context, but as IDEA International has very well put in, uh, in, in their writings on, on the topic, democratization is also about understanding and co incorporating people-driven processes into the design of initiatives. Uh, by extension, this also means that civilians should be at the center of any political process and uh, negotiation. And through an inclusive process, including uh, when discussing ceasefires, um, a sustainable solution is, is, is more likely to, to, be, to be reached. Um, over the years, the Netherlands has built strong relations with uh, Sudanese civil society, and we see it as our responsibility as well to um, put them in the lead uh, of the current processes and to continue supporting them in whatever way we can, and also in our partnership with uh, IDEA International. We believe that we must carefully listen uh, to the ideas and aspirations of people in Sudan uh, in, and to help them amplify their voices using their, um, their, their knowledge and their understanding of the context. And we must, in our turn, use our resources and our platforms to help them um, bring their messages across. So during today's uh, discussion, we hope to reflect both on past uh, practices and what we can learn from uh, what, what was done in the past, but also to understand what we, what we, uh, what we can do better and what can be done better in, in future in this regard. So we hope to jointly identify how we can support people living in those areas that are affected by um, continuing, continuing fighting at the moment and to strengthen the resilience of the civil society that is trying to achieve um, ceasefire and, uh, and a solution. Um, I, will, I would like to just end with one last uh, message and that's of wishing you and everyone here a very fruitful and productive discussion and thank you for organizing this very important and timely event. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, representative of the Netherlands, for, for those um, very wise words and excellent way to uh, introduce and, and uh, frame this, this discussion. So we will now turn over to, to our panelists. Um, and we will start with um, framing the, the, the discussion to take stock of the developments that, that led to the current situation in Sudan. Um, and we will do that with Dr. Baldo. Um, we will start with you. You are from Sudan. You're, as I said before, you're currently the executive director of Sudan's Transparency Policy Tracker. You have a very solid academic background and you have lectured also on these topics uh, in Sudan. You also have ample experience from the UN and African Union mediation processes in the region. Um, so we are hoping that you can kickstart the conversation by helping to frame the discussion, um, by telling us a little bit about the background of the events that led up to the current situation, uh, the events that led to uh, Sudan to where it is now, and the challenges of the democratic transition in the various phases of of this process leading up to the current situation. So I hand it over to you, Dr. Balde, to, to kickstart the conversation. Uh, thank you, and I hope uh, I could touch at some of the topics in the brief time uh, I will have uh, to discuss uh, this. Uh, once again, of course, Sudan is in the news for the very wrong reasons. Uh, in a town of Jinena, capital of the state of West Darfur, 80% of the population has been forcibly displaced by attacks that are not intertribal conflict or intercommunal conflict as often portrayed, portrayed wrongly in the media. From our observation of the situation there, this has been systematic attacks on unarmed civilians uh, on ethnic, on ethnic basis by the, one of the two fighting armies in, in Sudan, the rapid support forces, and militias allied to it. The specter of 2003 is with us again. Massive displacement already from West Darfur, there is 100,000 displaced in Chad, and we have seen the horrific scene of an entire city uh, population walking 
the 40 miles to the Chadian border uh, because of, of this uh, horrendous violence. This is an extension, but also a root of the violence in Khartoum because the rapid support forces had their root in the Janjaweed militia. It was reincarnated in the rapid support forces in 2003 to defend the then ruling regime of Omar al-Bashir. It is an extension of the Sudan Armed Forces, which is now you know, its uh, sworn enemy. It was trained, equipped, armed by the Sudan Armed Forces leaders of the, or the commanders of the two forces that are now fighting uh, have reached this point after decades of partnership in crime, uh, starting from 2003 uh, until today. And their blockage is not only for the aspiration of marginalized people of the peripheries of Sudan for treatment and equality, this is the genesis of this conflict uh, which is the, the protracted uh, long history uh, of, of, uh, uh, of inequality where power, wealth, influence have been concentrated in the center, you know, leading to armed uh, insurgencies. Uh, and for the regime of Omar al-Bashir, as I said, which is now deposed uh, to counter these armed rebellions, therefore uh, a specialized force, the representative forces was created to wage counterinsurgency by proxy from the Sudanese army. Therefore, the partnership was there in terms of the military uh, strategy and uh, as a reward to both the Sudan armed forces and the rapid support forces, the Bashir regime, of course, showered them with privileges, with uh, share in the national uh, economy, uh, companies for the Sudan armed forces, companies, for the commanders of the rapid support forces. Together, they have acted to suppress the aspirations of the Sudanese people uh, for democracy. And we have seen that happening times again, uh, especially after the uh, glorious revolution of 2018 in which youth groups, resistance committees, women associations, civil society, uh, neighborhood groups, uh, which uh, a, a, a peaceful, uprising against the Bashir of Omar, uh, against the regime of, of the National Congress Party and Omar al-Bashir, bringing it down after months at length uh, of repression. The continuous demand by the pro-democracy movement in Sudan for the handover of power from the military who just simply staged a grab following the fall of Bashir to institute a junta a military committee to rule Sudan, the population said, no, we want a transition in which the civilians are the, uh, you know, the leading the institutions of the state to transition Sudan to democracy. And this military repressive instrument, again, is the aspirations of, of the marginalized in, this, in, in the peripheries, and again, it's the pro-democracy movement. Uh, we have seen it, you know, repressing this peaceful protest through the massacre in Khartoum in, two th in, in 2019, uh, in which you know, a joint force of all Sudanese security forces uh, joined you know, in, 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 you know, in attacking and massacring uh, the sitting uh, participant. Uh, and therefore, this is, uh, you know, the, the conflict today is, is, you know, I would say it's in the very genetic structure of this security force that is suppressing democratic aspirations and aspirations for equality uh, from the regions. Uh, today, the rapid support forces tend against the army because of competition over the control of the uh, future uh, of Sudan uh, and the control over the resources that comes with it. Uh, the rapid support forces are embedded in the population in Khartoum, committing atrocious uh, violations uh, of, of uh, the rights of, of civilians to life, and, and the, you know the looting of proper property is done at a mass, massive uh, scale, systematically. They are holding hundreds of uh, detainees, many of them we consider as disappeared. The response of the government of Sudan is reliance. Uh, and, and the Sudanese army's reliance on the Air Force 
uh, uh, artillery, uh, and this is causing uh, much destruction. This is causing most of the uh, destruction that's occurring. Simply put, you know, the entire integrity of Sudan is at stake today. Uh, we are in a situation where the country could slide into total state failure. There isn't a government functioning in, in, in Khartoum today. The caretaker government instituted after the coup d'etat of 2021, October, is an absentee uh, government. We haven't seen it meeting to address the, the very special and, and, uh, and, and extreme uh, crisis that uh, occurred. Some ministers are in Port Sudan to, to you know, help with the uh, management of the uh, humanitarian situation from there through uh, the, uh, what is arriving in the city, not affected by the conflict, but uh, nothing else is being done with regard to restoring essential services and, and uh, provide what the government do. Government has not paid salaries, for example, for two months is now the duration uh, of the conflict. The bombings by both sides have, you know, destroyed the industrial base. The economic structure of Sudan today is totally at waste uh, because of this conflict at the national capital. Uh, at the national capital, and Khartoum is basically where most of the infrastructure in Sudan uh, is concentrated. Uh, and therefore, the, it will be uh, a very difficult post-conflict situation once the guns uh, finally are silent. You asked me in, in, in advance of this meeting, uh, Anika, about what the international uh, you know, community could do and, and focus on in these dire and extreme uh, situations. I believe the political processes and the mediation processes that are underway by multiple regional and international actors, uh, particularly the Intergovernmental Agency for Development, the IGAD, the African Union, and the Yedda process, uh, Arab League with a proposal that it has advanced, but the most uh, uh, active uh, concrete processes now are being uh, led by the African Union and the IGAD, each of which has a roadmap for resolving the conflict and ceasefire are actively, ceasefire negotiations are actively underway in Jeddah. So the process must prioritize, you know, whether in Jeddah or once people move to the phase of political negotiations, that process must prioritize, of course, the top priority is bringing an, aid, an end to hostilities, an area of sustainable humanitarian response to the crisis that privileged privileged civilian initiatives. And I'm saying privileged civilian initiatives because in the total absence of government in management of the crisis on the ground, in the hospitals, in the residential areas, it is civic actors who have stopped forward to provide responses to this. We see it in the hospitals that are run by volunteers, uh, doctors, health workers, resistance committee, uh, committee members who provide the, uh, you know, the few supplies that are available in one place to take them at a great risk to themselves to another. Uh, we see it in ordinary people who out of compassion and, and human solidarity uh, are coming uh, to help in, in, in addressing the medical crisis, for example. We see it in technicians who have drawn safe passages for civilians who want to leave the capital to go to regions that have not been affected by the conflict. So the crisis response is actually provided by civic actors at a very high level of organization, and the humanitarian response, the international humanitarian response, must uh, you know, be uh, informed of this and interact and, and channel uh, relief uh, through the, those who already are responding to the crisis for, in these dire conditions for the last two months. Restoration of civilian-led transition towards democratic transformation must be a, you know, a, a top priority. And in no circumstance, I would imagine that the international community would again commit the uh, mistake uh, of giving any legitimacy to the two fighting generals, having given them that opportunity following the, uh, you know, the, the, the power grab of, of uh, uh, 2019, following the fall of Bashir, having them again, uh, given them the opportunity 
when they were allied together uh, in the, uh, you know, in the wake of the uh, Khartoum massacre of, of the sitting, and again negotiating with them following the coup d'etat of 2021 against the civilian-led democratic transition. And therefore, there should be no, you know, concession uh, for any role for the two generals who are fighting today uh, in the post-conflict political dispensation. And instead, the, all the thrust should be towards a civilian-led, uh, you know, democratic uh, transition. Uh, definitely, um, that negotiation will be a difficult one. It should be an inclusive process with effective participation of civilians, including Sudanese women, uh, the youth who are in the forefront uh, of this uh, all pro-democracy development. Uh, I would leave it at that, and if uh, there are any follow-up questions, uh, you know, I, I could respond to this. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Baldo, for, the, for these um, uh, insights and the overview of what has led to the situation up until now. Um, important to emphasize the, the crucial role that civic actors are playing to keep uh, society going, including basic services and, and hospitals, um, and the importance of including civilians um, and women and youth um, and civil society in, in these um, negotiation processes going forward. Um, I do have follow-up questions, but I will hold them uh, until we've heard the other panelists. Um, we will now turn over to, to Maha Tambal. Um, you are also from Sudan, um, and you are here today to um, represent some of the voices of, civil, of Sudanese civil society. So you're not here to represent uh, in your role as DT Institute. Um, you have been engaged in conversations with um, former colleagues and friends in civil society that are both inside the country still and some are outside. So some of the views that you will present um, will reflect what they have also shared with you. So we wanted to hear from you um, um, how current developments uh, in the country are impacting on, on civil society and, and what civil society's responses have been to uh, the ongoing developments. Can, can you share some of those um, views? Over to you, Maha. Thank you so much, Anika, and thank you, Mr. Representative of the Netherlands, and thank you, everybody, for making time to attend in person or to follow us online. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to, to brief you today on what civil society has been doing during this crisis and even during the transition period. Um, actually, the, the continuation of the conflict in, in, in Khartoum and in North Kurdufan and in West, sorry, North, North Kurdufan, North Darfur and West Darfur is really um, resulting in kind of devastating impact uh, on the ground. Uh, we see that um, the number of death is really increasing, and we see direct impact on um, civilian properties, either in Khartoum or outside Khartoum in conflict zones. And this impact is really extended to the civil society themselves. We saw that um, most of the actively and well-established organizations and civil society um, groups who are operating in Khartoum, um, they have been now impacted by the um, by looting and destroying actions that uh, happens from the RSF, uh, who have been seizing civilian properties and, and seizing civilians' houses for military purposes and sometimes just to shelter um, um, in place on those, uh, on those places. So as a result, we see most of the civil society groups have been um, either flee the country, those who have uh, resilient operational capacity, they managed to flee the country. Others were managed to shelter in safe regions um, outside the capital Khartoum um, in, in many urban cities. Um, this has been temporarily impacting their day-to-day -day operational capacities, but at the end of the day, they are still committed to their values and committed to their um, to their um, to their principles to support uh, Sudanese people to, to raise their demands on having freedom, peace, and access to justice. Um, as, 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 as an immediate action, um, civil societies, similarly to other Sudanese groups, have the value of solidarity is really high. So we saw that the resistance committees, we saw the youth-led groups, the civil society groups, and the community-led organizations have been engaging together through a kind of community-led approach where they managed to provide um, emergency response to help doctors to operate um, dysfunctioning health facilities, providing life safe um, aid to, to needy people, 
helping in burying dead bodies, piling um, um, on the streets, um, try providing logistical support to citizens who are fleeing countries. We also see, um, see the civil society um, actively engaging through the, the civil society activists and the online content creator to, to, to do um, campaigns, uh, online campaigns to, to combat the disinformation propaganda that's being widely spread by SAF and RSF equally. So just to raise the awareness of people on this mass disinformation spread and to provide reliable resources of information, disinformation, including access to health facilities, access to some logistical uh, providers. So these are just like a, a, a simple day-to-day -day, um, actions that civil society group has been voluntarily taking. Um, we saw also the civil society groups who, ha who have uh, logistical privilege to access to internet nowadays have been engaging with some uh, with some Sudanese voices in diaspora overseas in Europe or in Africa or in the US so that they can bring their voices uh, up to the international community to brainstorm uh, on what uh, actions to be taken in response to this crisis and how to coordinate also on the ground day-to-day -day actions. Um, Despite the civil society has been entirely excluded from the uh, from quote unquote ceasefire talks in Jeddah, but we saw that uh, some civil society groups like the youth um, youth networks observers it's 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 just a pure voluntary youth network who organized themselves. They set their mandate to monitor the ceasefire that took place um, um, on May 30 up to uh, June 3rd. They had they documented the ceasefire this time this short ceasefire period, they documented, they used very primitive qualitative tools, they managed to document it, to visualize the data, and to publish their reports. So I think this is a very brave role from them in this very critical timing. They took this, uh, this res responsibility on a voluntary basis, and we really need to support this kind of actions. We, we also see the civil society striving to provide advanced establishment of humanitarian corridors during the ceasefire, but the problem is the ceasefire itself, uh, it's not like a real ceasefire. It's just an opportunity for the RSF to continue looting civilian properties and houses. There is no real ceasefire so that accordingly those voluntarily civil society groups can help establishment of humanitarian corridors to help people to move or to help people to access to health or even to go to just purchase some goods and, and, and do some other day-to-day -day stuff. So that's part of the gap. So we, we see them trying to overcome this gap through following some security protocols by you know uh, naming everybody and try to provide the small networks of, of groups that everybody knows each other and try to guard also the neighborhoods. But that's something really, it's beyond their, their very limited capacity as, as civilians. So, uh, but I just want to say that what the civil society is now been doing during this crisis is just an extension of the very promising role that they played uh, even prior to uh, December 2018, but also during the, gover the transition government where, where they had this enhanced civic space where the civil society managed to engage in, 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 in the Juba peace talks, they managed to engage with um, monitoring the transitional government, civil society, most of the civil society groups were not officially represented in the transitional government, the first or the second transitional government, so they opted to, to choose the, the, the observer uh, role. They have been monitoring the transition process, creating pressure on the government to increase accountability and access to justice, and then we had the coup, and then we saw that um, all the civic space has been collapsed again and uh, space has been really get very tight for civil society to freely acting. But even during the coup period, we saw that some of the uh, trade unions and professional associations, they managed to really to merit during this critical time. For instance, we were really following the Sudanese journalist syndicate selections and that was like a very, the fairest election since decades. We managed to see also the Lawyers Association um, providing constitutional draft that provided a breakthrough for, um, for the December 2022 framework agreement. Um, we saw the resistance committees managed to group together and uh, publishing their declarations to, to, to rule themselves and to govern their, um, their role during the transition. So they have been engaging in, 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 different, in different forms to shape the political space during the coup. And now I think the urgent need for them to continue 
serving that role is to increase their voices in international platform, to let really the international community knows what those people are doing and how they can support them. We know that there are too many logistical challenges for international community to be in person present in Sudan, but they can rely on those groups through different um, means of communication to empower them, to enable them to, to play those roles independently, to, to really to bridge the infrastructural gaps and to break the day-to-day -day governmental gaps that really the country is now getting through. So, uh, but I think we can go through that uh, maybe in a different round. I just don't want, I don't want to seize the floor. Thank you so much, uh, Maha, for these very interesting insights, both on the role that civil society um, in, in the broad sense played um, during the transition and, and even after the coup, uh, including not just NGOs, but also um, trade unions and lawyers associations and so on, but, but also how they have now shifted their role um, to not just humanitarian uh, services and, and support, um, although a lot of them probably are um, being absorbed by that, by those functions, but that there are still some that are finding the, the space to to do other important things like monitoring the ceasefires and documenting um, and also fighting um, disinformation, the disinformation that is spreading and, and using the online space also and other creative tools to make their voices heard. So we hear your plea also on, on the importance of international actors supporting civil society um, voices, whether they are inside the country or outside. Uh, also the role of diaspora and their connection with local groups inside the country. I think that's very important. But we will hear more uh, from you uh, later on, but we will now turn to my uh, dear colleague, uh, Dr. Sami Said, um, who heads International Ideas Sudan program since 2020. Since the conflict broke out, you have had to leave the country uh, like uh, most of your colleagues of the IDEA program, they have either um, left the country or have uh, fled into rural areas outside of, of the capital. Um, so we want to hear from you, um, Sami. How has International IDEA supported the democratic transition in Sudan in the various phases and even past the coup um, until now? Um, and, um, and what organizations such as IDEA can do to support democracy? democratization in Sudan if there is are such prospects now in the current context uh, going forward. But, but maybe you can first tell us a little bit about what International IDEA did do in these various phases of the transition so we understand better. Thank you. Thank you, Anika. Uh, and thank you for, for, for all those who are attending this uh, in person or those uh, virtually attending this uh, important briefing about the situation in Sudan. In particular, our uh, IDEA member state uh, representing their uh, countries in, in the UN and who is attending this briefing also. Uh, International IDEA actually signed the agreement with the transitional government in, on, in, in October 2020 in, in the, with the Minister of Foreign Affairs uh, uh, and based on, the, uh, uh, based on a request came from the, from the transitional government to International Institutes for Democracy and Electoral Assistance International IDEA to support the transitional process during the uh, three time of the, of the transition. And actually, International IDEA came with, the, with other international organizations, those who came to support the transition in Sudan, and, and they be, began to, to reach Sudan since the revolution or since the, since the, the, the establishment of the transitional government. And that, uh, after April 2020, uh, 2019. Uh, most, of, most of those, uh, uh, those uh, international organizations uh, came to Sudan. They came with very uh, strong support from international community and from their own headquarters uh, with a million of, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars to support the transition in general including International IDEA, who came to support the transition with a very good support from the International IDEA headquarters in Stockholm and in a, in a strong uh, partnership with the uh, Sweden International Development uh, uh, Agency and uh, European Union in, in, in Sudan. So mainly, uh, 
the support was just focusing on the, in the mandate of the transitional government, which cited in the transitional uh, constitution of 2019. So those uh, priorities were listed there, and from there we started supporting the transitional government. But technically, international idea is, is well known as a think tank and, 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 and uh, uh, expert on areas, areas of uh, constitutional building, electoral assistance, uh, political participation, and gender and peace building. So in those areas, international idea, uh, closely with the, with the national transitional government and other international uh, donors and actors in Sudan, we were operating in Sudan. And later, we, we established with other international organizations a committee of uh, following this, uh, this process and came later with, uh, under, uh, with a close uh, coordination with the UNITAMIS, the, uh, the UN political mission in Sudan, to, to, to organize and to, to avoid duplication in, in, in providing such kind of support. Uh, from there, we start building that connection with the transitional government, with the, with the Ministry of Justice, with the Ministry of Federal Governance, and, and also with the, with the Office of the, of the Prime Minister. So those, those three institutions were mainly those who are like in the same area of operation with international idea. So international idea was providing technical support to, to the Minister of Justice in um, developing a new draft for the new constitution for uh, future Sudan, and also a new electoral uh, uh, reform system, and, and also supporting the federal government system in, 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 in expanding and dialogue and discussion and negotiation on the issue of federal uh, governance and also supporting the, the Juba Peace Agreement implementation that signed in, uh, in, in October 2021. So that was the area of support international idea was trying to, to provide with, the, with other uh, international uh, actors. Uh, as Dr. Suleiman Beldu mentioned that in, in, in October 2021, uh, when the coup happened, the two, uh, the two military functions, the, the um, uh, Sudanese military forces and the rabbit forces together, they, and their alliances, they, they went through that uh, uh, coup d'etat and they dismissed the, the transitional cabinet uh, suspended the, uh, the transitional constitution, part of the transitional constitution, including those committees and, uh, and, and drafting committees and sub uh, uh, ministries committees all, all were dissolved. So the, those who were already like cooperating and, and, and in, the, in the process of uh, handling this support, technical support from international idea to the transitional government. Uh, so accordingly, all those uh, support were suspended, and the international community, interna including international idea, already uh, decided to suspend their support to the transitional government, to the coup, uh, to the coup leaders, or also the de facto uh, government, so uh, those support were. The same when we were trying to uh, support the, the uh, reshaping the process and to bring back the, uh, the transitional uh, uh, process back to the table, uh, by initiating a negotiation between the civilian and military and signing a new kind of uh, political pact and, uh, and, and, and designing the process, uh, the, the war uh, uh, came and started and the hostilities started in April 2023 in April. Uh, and all, all, all those uh, activities also again suspended and the international uh, community, uh, community, including international idea, uh, suspended again their activities in Sudan. Uh, their staff member uh, evacuated outside the country. Uh, their offices were looted and their assets destroyed by the by the by the uh, 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 militia groups. Uh, expert facilitators, uh, uh, consultant, they left Sudan and so. From there, we, we as, as an international organization, we start operating from our side of Sudan by liaising with the international community, including the UN, AU, EGAD, and, 
and uh, instead of Arab leagues, just to rethink about how we can bring back the process and to support Sudanese people to reshape their future, peaceful and democratic future. Uh, and from there, uh, the, the support and, 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 and technical, uh, 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 technical research uh, uh, seminars, round table, as a part of the preparation for the mediation and dialogue between the, between the concerned uh, uh, factors, including the two military functions and, and the political parties and international community, just to support the, the process to go. Uh, so far, the two parties, they uh, actually, so far, being uh, unwilling to implement comprehensive ceasefire, uh, also that one of the challenges that uh, international community, including international idea, uh, they, they fail to go and reach people in ground uh, and also to provide support. So far, the technical support to the mediation, to the, uh, uh, to the concern military, uh, concern uh, 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 negotiating uh, parties and also mediating a mechanism, it is uh, it's still available uh, under such, or the, under the current circumstances also, in which all institutions of, of, of the national uh, government are, are not around and have been destroyed during this uh, um, military operation, and international personnel have left Sudan also. Clearly, we can notice that there is no uh, effective and professional uh, institution that can provide any kind of support in the national level. So that also brings more concern about the need of international community to bring more technical support and also uh, to support the, 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 the mediation uh, whether it is under the Jeddah platform or a new platform, in, in all cases, the, the only way to, 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 to support the Sudanese people is to push for the, for the more, push more for the, for the uh, peaceful uh, discussion or peaceful negotiation between two parties and also including civilians who are looking for the future of a safe uh, and, and secure and, and democratic Sudan. Uh, a movement actually have been launched from, from, from inside Sudan, from civil society, from many uh, civilian component and, and, and a democratic movement to, to bring the voice of civilian Sudanese to the negotiating table. Uh, and from there, I think also the international community and international ideas is willing to, to, to support that, those initiative of uh, women group, uh, youth group, uh, political parties, uh, uh, academia, universities, all are pushing now to uh, to stop this war and start uh, again for the for the a new cycle of the transitional democratic transition and peaceful transition for Sudan. I will stop here and look for uh, any uh, feedback from the uh, for those who are attending. And thank you, uh, Nika. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Said, for um, providing. Um, your views and uh, some information on what International IDEA has been doing to support the democratic transition in Sudan and, and what it's doing now to try to support also the mediation um, processes that are happening. Maybe building on, on the topic of, of mediation processes, uh, you have all mentioned that there are a number of attempts ongoing. Um, which one of, of those do you think are most viable uh, and most promising in terms of um, uh, going towards peace? Uh, I don't know if, if maybe Dr. Baldo, would, would you want to answer that question? Or Thank you. Um, the obstacle to successful mediation now is the uh, unwillingness of the parties to engage directly. Uh, because uh, they have persuaded themselves that they could win militarily on the ground. And until that calculation changes, uh, I think there will be difficulties, as we are seeing now in the Jeddah platform, uh, of uh, even securing uh, you know, a ceasefire that holds. The ceasefires are violated. We have now reached a dozen of them with the, with the latest that ended yesterday. Uh, it was respected the fairest day. There was quiet in the fighting in Khartoum, but not in Darfur. In Darfur, the, the rebel support forces uh, attacked and uh, took control of the town of um, 
uh, Tawila in, in North Darfur, for instance. So they, uh, but then uh, the second day fighting resumed and the third day we, we witnessed intense fighting again. However, the parties remain present in Jeddah. That means they are willing to continue negotiating and I think the next window of opportunity is the uh, Eid, uh, you know, uh, Al-Adha, which is around the corner uh, within, uh, you know, the coming days. And uh, this is, a religious, uh, this is a, you know, the most important and prominent religious feast in, in Islam and I think the negotiators could use that as leverage to get them to agree to a more extended ceasefire and to observe it uh, this time. The population really needs a break. Uh, you know, and we don't need to go to the details because this is what you receive reports about every day. But we are talking about millions of Sudanese They're still stranded in Khartoum, many of them in crossfire zones, unable to uh, procure, uh, you know, uh, food or unpaid salaries for months now, and no access to cash because of the collapse of banking uh, services. And this situation is reaching a point where something has to happen, and that's something which is forcing the belligerents to uh, observe a ceasefire that is monitored and, and, and observed by independent uh, quarters, uh, to which you know uh, the international community should should really make sure that we raise the stakes because of the high risk to the population and because of the high risk to the integrity of an entire country, Sudan. You know, it's, it's really at, at the risk of a state collapse. And if that happens, the entire region of the Sahel and the Horn of Africa, East Africa, South Sudan will be affected by this, not to mention Egypt and, and, and Libya to the north and so on. So there is urgency for an observable ceasefire. And the only mechanism to get there is now the Jeddah platform. The African Union, as I mentioned, and IGAD uh, and, and uh, League of Arab States are, are all positioning themselves to take on the process of, you know, of, of the political mediation for the political dispensation in the post-conflict uh, uh, period. But we are not there yet. You know, we don't have an observable and, and uh, monitored ceasefire yet. Uh, separation of forces, humanitarian access is a priority. All these fires, because of the way they, they, they were not observed, did not allow meaningful relief to reach the people most at the risk who are isolated in crossfire zones. Yes, no, absolutely. Very important. Um, the humanitarian access as a first priority and actual ceasefire before any uh, political uh, mediation can take place. Um, so um, maybe just one, one uh, more question to, to Maha. Um, the, the, we know uh, the, how strong the pro-democracy movement was in the overthrow of the, of the former regime. Um, and it's been very united in its um, in, in that overthrow, uh, but th there are concerns also that it's a very diverse movement and that there are some fractures within the movement and, and that the current situation is sort of exacerbating those differences. So what are your views on this and, and is it possible to sort of reunite the pro-democracy movement uh, that is fractured also geographically now because many of them are spread out in other countries around a common vision for, for the country? Thank you, Anika. Um, I think um, this it has two it has two faults. Um, I will come to the fragility and the division among the civil society, but uh, when it comes to supporting civil society, regardless, it needs the physical proximity and the technical support from international community. We understand that most of the operating um, agencies in Sudan, they have been suspending their operation in Sudan temporarily to evacuate their uh, international staff and to do hibernational re relocation for their national staff to shelter in place and to ensure their safety and security. But I think it's really high time for um, international agencies to think considering reoperating in Sudan through very small facilities. They can have very small offices like in Port Sudan, in, in, in Kesala, in Medani, a small communication office, a small operational office, have like one or two national staff working there just to allow these international organizations to have 
an existence in the country, and then you can move forward and see how you can expand this existence. But having just leaving Sudan and citizens isolated like this is taking people nowhere. So there is a need to to, to reoperate and think on how how, how international um, organizations can reoperate in Sudan. And this also applies to the humanitarian aid um, um, actors. They need to. I, identify mechanisms where they can collectively work together. We see that ICRC, Qatar Foundation, are now able to, to, to send um, personnel and, and aid to, to, to Port Sudan, but there are still some gaps in terms of the day-to-day -day functionality of the system in Port Sudan. But this kind of experience, it's important to understand how this experience operates. How do ICRC were able to facilitate the access of humanitarian assistance to, to Port Sudan? and then other international um, humanitarian actors can follow or just learn lesson, lessons from this experience and then try to replicate it. That's if we manage to provide this scene of this support, we can go further and see what happens from the, at the civil society. There are two challenges in the civil society. The, we have the, what we can call it like proliferation of initiatives like a civil society, they like grouping. So that's, they have this kind of divisions they have. They, their division is not on the goal, but on the approach. So we may need to create the incentive, if we may need to create incentive that we can unify this goal and we have the space to have diversity approach where we can really customize approaches from those divided groups. We take this from this and this from this and bring them, them, them together. This can create incentive for them that where they can equally participating or where they can diversity participating to bringing their different tools into one, into a consensus, whatever it is. And the other problem, I th we saw that most of the pro-democracy movements are really brilliant in ousting dictator regimes, but they fail to undertake or to move or to push transition forward. And I would say, this is my personal opinion, and I would say the root cause for this is really the political parties. Whenever we have civilian coalitions, political parties, they take advantage of these coalitions and they are imposing their political agenda, and this creates these divisions. So there is a need to separate the role of the political parties in this crisis. They really need to focus on, them, on themselves. They have too many institutional fragility inside their political institutions. They need to work on that. They need to do institutional reformation. They need to see how they can refine their political tools. And I think international organizations like IDEA, IFIS, and other uh, organizations that are working on governance and accountability can really help to reform the political parties. They should refrain from imposing their political agenda on civilian coalitions. They just mess it up. So uh, that's, that's one thing, if we manage to really mitigate the role of civil society, we can push these civilian coalitions forward with some very close technical support. Um, um, I think now, the, in, in just du in, during this crisis, what we really need to do is to bring them onto an agenda how they can participate in the ceasefire. International community should understand that Jet the platform is really useless and, unless you have civilian representation, inclusive civilian representation, and to have them represented and also in the monitoring mechanisms. We, we, we know that the Jet the platform, they identified a, a monitoring mechanism, but civilians are not represented. Um, international agencies are not represented. We have limited representation of international agencies, but they should be expanded. And if we supplemented this with physical, limited physical existence of those international agencies in Sudan, we will have a good impact on, on having a lasting monitoring mechanism on the ground. The other thing is also, if we really need to help the civil society, I mean, we know that the civil society is operating with limited technical and financial capacities, but they cannot be blamed for everything. We really need to do some other homework to just to, to, to provide the scene for them, to provide conducive environment for them. And that means we really need to have a government functioning in Sudan. I would say um, USA, KSA, and those who are really undertaking, uh, facilitating the platform, they need to bring different agenda to the, to, to the negotiating table. Like the ceasefire is just, it's, it's not really active, it's not real in, in, in Sudan, nobody is really sensing any benefit from the ceasefire. Just for instance, when we had the ceasefire that announced on June 18th, a few hours after that, my family house in Khartoum has been entirely destroyed and we have too many electronic devices and valuable goods being taken. So just, this is an example, this is my family house in Sudan, this is what had happened to them. 
and it, this applies to everybody. So we really need to bring different agenda to the negotiating table. I know that the U.S., they are smart in doing the carrot and stick um, po policy. They can really play that game with, with those uh, two generals to, to push them to discuss different agendas. So if we manage to help having a government functioning in Sudan, we can really provide the environment for, for the civil society. But we cannot put all the pressure on them, asking them to do a lot while nobody is really standing behind them. Thank you so much, uh, Maha. These are very important points. Um, not to put any, everything on civil society, also the important role of political parties and the need to reform them. And, and crucially what you've said, two things, civilian representation uh, in, the, in the Jeddah platform um, and also an urge and a plea to international organizations uh, and uh, international NGOs to continue not to leave Sudan, to continue operating, even if it's a small presence where it's feasible. Um, I, I would, would like the other panelists to also provide some recommendations, but I first wanted to open up the floor for questions, if there are any questions um, from, from anyone here in the room. Um, may I ask that you introduce yourself and um, the, your organizational or country affiliation. Um, yes, over to you. Uh, good afternoon. I am Maria Lourdes Santos, representing Vivat International, a, a non-governmental organization with consultative status with ECOSOC. And yesterday was the World Refugee Day, and with 10 other NGOs, we um, issued uh, a statement regarding how the refugees are being affected by this prolonged conflict in Sudan. We all know already that mm, uh, there are many refugees in, in Sudan and um, other refugees coming from neighboring countries are also coming in like the Eritrean people who are also trying to flee from their own country. And mm, as they arrive in Sudan, they are forced to 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 run to other countries because of this conflict, and for example, to South Sudan. And the subhuman condition that they are experiencing because of the prolonged conflict. And just uh, since yesterday is the uh, World Refugee Day, maybe I can read part of our statement that as we, set, as we observe the World Refugee Day yesterday under the theme, Hope Away From Home, it is critical to hold a ceasefire in Sudan without delay and take care of the rights of refugees in compliance with international humanitarian law, refugee law, and human rights law. And maybe I can ask our panelists, how are they, in their knowledge, are they responding to the plea of these refugees that are really affected by the conflict in Sudan? Thank you for, for that question. Is there any of the panelists that would like to respond to that question? Yeah. Yes, Dr. Sami. Uh, thank you for the question, actually. Yes, actually, uh, the, there is so many challenges. If you just, if you can see that the, the war itself is now is uh, now is covering more new areas, including Darfur, for example. And refugees now and, uh, and displaced uh, uh, persons now are crossing the national border to, to Chad. And according to news coming from there, also you can see that there is no presence for international humanitarian assistance in Chad. And most of the support that comes usually from the local community and in local civil societies. The same problem with the, with the Sudanese who flee the, 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 the capital going to Egypt and Ethiopia. There are so many uh, uh, visa restrictions and people just stuck in the border without any basic needs and services in those areas. Uh, still, the, the support that still comes uh, uh, come from from the local communities, those who are hosting people uh, in their houses, providing food and other. But still, the, those needs are including hospitals, security, and 
and other services which is not available in those uh, area. Uh, the 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 Jupa platform uh, mainly they were trying to address the issue of the protection for the civilian during this war and and that 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 uh, arrangement for the short and long uh, uh, ceasefire was just aiming to uh, to support uh, people to move from the risky area to a more secure and safety area but the two parties as i mentioned in my first uh, uh, briefing that they were not like willing to go for that implementation of the any kind of uh, uh, agreement that they 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 agreed to go through uh, in in in, in Jeddah in Jeddah agreement that is uh, that is a situation unless we have uh, a, a solid and a strong uh, a commitments from the two parties to uh, and the uh, and also international monitoring for the ceasefire uh, the civilian will be the first uh, uh, victims on this uh, uh, of this uh, military operation inside the, the capital and other neighborhood in, in, the, in Khartoum. Uh, other things that need to be also ad to be mentioned and to be addressed in the future or the coming days, that the, the, the government should also try to support the international uh, human humanitarian assistance workers to come and access the, those areas and to provide the support. Now most of the things now are stuck in 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 in, in Port Sudan, and some of them are not even uh, uh, managed to to uh, download those uh, uh, containers outside of this uh, outside of this uh, 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 ships. So that is a problem because there is no uh, there is no functioning uh, institution in place. Most of the officials of the of the institutions they left the country to a more secure area, whether it's inside the country or outside of the country. So there is no, uh, there is no um, operating uh, uh, institution, official, to support the civilian. Still, that also brings the need of the, bring, the, bring to, the, to, the, to the discussion the need of the international support. Thank you, Anika. Thank you so much, uh, Sami. Are there any other questions from the floor? No, no more questions. Yes, one. Uh, my question is, uh, Dr. Beldo, please. Uh, Dr. Beldo, my question is based on an assumption, actually. I hope it will come one day. Had the, in the future, peace has come, no more war. And we had the chance again to have a political transitional stage or phase, like the one which has been going before April 15. Would you think that we had the right path towards political transition in the past, that we should take the same model again with us in the future, or there should be a change? Thank you very much. This is uh, a very difficult moment for Sudan because it's facing really an existentialist threat. The level of destruction that is occurring now, the level of stress and, and, and uh, suppression and, and uh, oppression of, of uh, civilians in the country, the level of uh, attacks on state institutions has never been reached to this level and that's why uh, I opened my intervention by saying, you know, there is a threat to the integrity of, of the country. I believe that it is incumbent upon us, the Sudanese, in the wake of this war, to really confront this legacy, this history of not acknowledging the root causes of continued conflict in the country. And that must be the foundation for any future uh, dispensation. The root cause is this uh, legacy of inequality, of disparity between the ruling classes, elites in the center of Sudan and the rest of the country. And this disparity has been pushed to extreme polarization during the 30 years 
of the regime of Omar al-Bashir, and we never had a chance following the, 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 the fall of Bashir to have a genuine uh, reform uh, of the institutions of, 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 of the state so that the cultural the issues, uh, the cultural roots, the um, issues of identity that are at the, at the basis of all this conflict are properly addressed, and also the economic, the economic disparities between uh, and among the, the Sudanese themselves. So the challenge is really great. Uh, my concern is that you know, this current war is leading to a level of divisiveness in Sudanese society that we have not seen. Uh, you know, uh, before, uh, with, uh, you know, people who are accusing each other of being a traitor because they are calling for an end to the, to the war, questioning their patriotism or their commitment to, to, to the country and, and, and so on. Uh, no, we need to rise to, to the challenge and be above, uh, you know, this divisiveness. If I may add. Um, yeah, I think um, just to add to that, addressing the root causes, uh, the equal and inclusive access to wealth and power, and also I think corruption is one of also the root causes that really become um, a growing a growing cause. But if we are look at the modality we had during the transition in 2019, if that modality is really a valid one to to think about, if we manage to have a peace in place. That modality, it has its, its plus and minuses, and I think we may need to really to very fairly look at the lesson learned from that modality and try really to mitigate the gaps. And, and I would say really the gaps that, one of the gaps at that modality, like the political party were, were, were really in rush to take power. They haven't really followed the book of transition. Transition, it doesn't mean political parties should be engaged in, in, in ruling at that moment. They need to do their, their institutional reform and leave the floor for technocrats to lead the country to the election moment. I think this is where the gap that we had at that, at that time when, when we applied that FFC modality. If we manage really to address this as, as, a, as a gap in this experience, we might have a more promising modality to, 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 to follow if we manage to have a peace in place. If that answers your question. Thank you so much for these views. We're coming to the end of our session, um, but I, before we close, I just wanted to ask if there are any more uh, sort of recommendations that you would want to make, any of you on the panel, to, to international organizations, to the UN or to member states, um, before we close. Um, uh, that we cannot have sustainable peace in Sudan uh, in the post-conflict when this war stops without really addressing the root causes of continued conflict and civil wars in Sudan, but also without a serious endeavor of, or a serious program rather, of, of security sector reform. Security sector reform is essential. You know, no state maintains two regular armies, two legally constituted and uh, mandated uh, regular armies, as that has been the case in Sudan, and we have seen the result. In the end, they fell apart and destroyed the country in fighting each other. This should not be allowed to continue. Uh, all armed uh, factions of the armed movements, for example, that saw in Juba are now autonomous and moving on their own. As private armies of this uh, particular armed movement, there are more than five of them. That has to end. And I think uh, this would be, uh, you know, uh, my uh, concluding remark, you know, that security sector reform has to be prioritized. Thank you. Very good. Um point to, to end this conversation. Uh, thank you so much to, to our panelists for your insightful views. I hope it, it has been a uh, useful and interesting uh, discussion for you all present here. Um, we're really hoping that uh, the hostilities will cease uh, soon, uh, immediately, and um, that there is a ceasing of targeting of civilians. Um, 
that humanitarian access is secured for those in need and that we, we can support uh, the Sudanese people uh, in this very difficult moment. So thank you very much for attending today and thanks to the panelists. Thank you.